Hi, I'm Brian Germain, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the psychology of skydiving. We have an emotional side and an intellectual side, and they both want to jump out of an airplane. However, sometimes the emotional side has a little trouble of figuring out whether it's appropriate or not. Um, and so that discernment skill is one of the most important things of all. And so when we uh, consider jumping out of an airplane with given conditions, specific gear, uh, the, the type of jump that you plan on, uh, the evaluation process is quite important. The trouble is that the human mind is a subjective tool. And so we have all sorts of thoughts going on in our heads and some of them are, are serving us and some of them aren't. Uh, so we have this uh, sort of sane and neurotic side of, of each of us. Um, and sometimes the voice in our head is giving us information that we really, really need. It says, don't jump. Um, and so this discussion uh, that I'm gonna share with you now is, uh, of course, with permission, a, uh, a client that I've worked with for a while who felt kind of bad about scratching off a load. And just her gut was telling her, don't do this jump for whatever reason. And, uh, and so, well, let's, let's pick it up there. That was the final push for me. I just had a gut feeling like just not today. It's, it'll be here again next weekend. That's great. I mean, to honor your gut is really important. It's easy to go with the peer pressure, but right. it's not, not so easy to, to listen to your body and you know, that, that the soft voice, I call it yeah. the one that says you shouldn't jump when, when there's mm -hmm. actually something's about to happen. You know, if you do the jump or you get in that car or whatever, you know, your guidance is telling you that, that you can avoid this, but it doesn't scream. The only thing that screams is the ego, you know, which, yeah. is, which is basically, you know, sort of fear and separation based. And it's kind of a big fat bummer, you know, always. Right. So whatever that is, you just got to put your fingers in your ears and listen quietly, mm -hmm. you know, listen, listen for the guidance. And you did that. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. The hardest part is telling them, you know, I pulled myself off the load. Like, I don't want to disappoint anybody, but it's just, it wouldn't have been productive. It's not about them. Right. Right. Um, because they don't, they don't know what you know, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that secret intel is just as simple as, as how you feel. And even if there's no obvious reason, if you get in the plane not feeling great, you know, it's, it's hard to turn it around. You're going to get better at that. You're right. going to get better at rationalizing, you know, the, the risk and go, okay, what are the winds? Is the gear okay? Do I know the skydive? You know, do I know the spot? That sort mm -hmm. of thing. You know, do I know where my holding area is? And if you have all that information and, and you just go, you know what, there's no reason not to, it's just a feeling. Right. You're, going to, you're going to be able to turn that around and clear your mind, you know, as they say, shake the etch-a-sketch mm -hmm. and, and sort of put all those thoughts aside and just be in silence for a little while. I like to go and you know sit in nature. You know, you go out, go out to the landing area if you got the time, and you just sit on that rock on the hill. You know, absolutely, yep. Make that your kind of your sacred space, and and, and you can often um, turn yourself around. You know, when mm -hmm. you've made that that sort of rational balancing process in your right. mind. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you get to the end of that process and go, you know, the, the, not all the boxes are checked. You know, I don't like the I don't like the winds. And I'm just drawing my line. Good for yeah. you. Good right. for you. But if you get to the end of the list and and you find yourself still questioning your your capabilities, often you kind of have to just sort of put all of those thoughts, that whole thought complex that you've built and the emotions that came from it, shove it off to the side and call it misguided thought. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it just just sort of let it go and stay with silence a little bit longer you know, in your own mind and stay without a conclusion a little longer, you know, stay in maybe yeah. <laughs> a little longer. You're in yeah. maybe, you're in maybe until you're actually in free fall, <laughs> you know, right. you're in maybe yeah. right up until the time you get into the door and look around and, and make your decision whether you want to go or not. And I think yeah. that's a, that's a powerful. That's what, that's what I've always said is like, I am, once I'm out of the plane, I'm fine. But it's yeah. everything, the ground and the and the ride up to altitude where I can just be my own worst enemy sometimes. Sure. Well, we all have that. Yeah. Uh, so so what do we have to fend off the bully, you know, mm -hmm. the, bully, the bully in our minds that's that's, uh, you know, that it generates all these fear based thoughts and it skews our rationality. It grabs mm -hmm. greater. It actually adds weight to the things that we're afraid of 
and makes us think that those things are likely. When they're not likely, they're just repeated thoughts that we've obviously brainwashed ourselves into expecting that reality. Yep. And you know, so we all we all know we've all done it in other circumstances, but you know, the, the volume sort of turned up in skydiving. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the the emotions are, are more intense. So to to spend more time with meditation and yoga and stuff and, and cultivate your skill to just empty your mind, you know, and, and then you'll hear the soft voice that says, you know how to do this. Yep. You're, you're powerful, you're smart, you're strong, you're capable of solving problems. You know, until you have that first cutaway, yeah, right. you know what I mean? Until you have that first off field landing or that tumbled exit that you recover from, you mm-hmm. know, you do a back loop and it doesn't go so well yeah. and you're scared up to that point. You're scared. You're never going to get stable again. If you get unstable and then it happens, you arch and you, oh, good. One more thing that I can put in the category of power mm-hmm. of, con- of control, you know, and you just yeah. got to keep revisiting those experiences that you've already had where you were a rock star you're a superhero yeah avoiding something in your car or taking the deep breath when it could have been an argument and you used your skillful means to de-escalate a situation you know we all have that capability sure it's magic it's magic i think it's the strongest suit that the human beings have you know we don't have long fingernails we don't have big teeth we can't (laughs) run that fast you know, four days without water, we're dead. You know, we're not, right. that, we're not that amazing. And yet our ability to turn our emotions around based on a rational appraisal, which takes notebooks sometimes, you know, where you, you just draw a line down the middle, like, okay, what are my reasons for jumping right now? What are my reasons not to? Maybe you just do it in your mind. But I think it's really important to go through a ritual of rationalizing the risk mm-hmm. so that you can proceed with caution sometimes, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, you know it's dangerous, but you proceed anyway because you realize that it's not an unreasonable risk this time. Yeah, yeah, that's very valid. Yes, yeah. But you know, <laughs> dealing with winds is a big. That's one of the biggest reasons for people to stand down, mm-hmm. you know? and it's one of the best reasons to stand down when it's appropriate. Right. <laughs> yeah. The tricky bit is you know when it's you know 10, 12 miles an hour and everything's okay, and you're just you get in your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Start, are picturing with that visualization center you misuse the the prefrontal cortex to visualize you landing off Mm -hmm. facing into the wind and going backwards you know all those things are possible everything's possible the question is what are you going to make happen right yeah that's that's the sky god attitude that you need to to start to allow within yourself the confidence that no matter what it is you know malfunction or other complexity i got this yeah I know where my handles are. <laughs> yep. That's what I said. I'm like, I know where my handles are. I know I'm all I really need to make sure I do is pull. And mm-hmm. then I know where my, my cutaways are and what to do. So I have it all. I know what I'm doing. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And, and even stuff like wear and tear on the gear that might trigger you initially, you mm-hmm. know, you just have to sort of absorb the initial wave of the adrenaline, the, the thoughts that happen that cause that adrenaline and just wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. What is this really? You know, is this, what, what could this actually do? Like mm-hmm. realistic, what are the possibilities? And then you pare that down to what is likely to occur, right? Because there's always, there's, there's the possibilities and then there's the likelihoods. You got to live in likelihoods. Otherwise you spend your whole life worrying about you know everything <laughs> exactly yes and i was just like i and that's what i've said i made i made such a i made a lot of progress with my anxiety thus far like as, as far as what i've told you when i was i sold my house and i'm mm-hmm. living for life and things like that and so i'm that's just great. like I don't and then after the afterthought of course after i pulled myself off i was just like why did i let it win <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it didn't win. It didn't win. Your power over your decision-making process won. You know, mm-hmm. so your ability to, to make that decision and stand down, you should feel proud of that every time yeah. you do it. Because I still haven't been hurt by a skydiver didn't do. True. Yeah. It, and I, and, like and I've, not, I've not done a lot of them. You know, anywhere I walk out yeah. to the plane and go, yeah, you know, or I'm about to put my rig on and maybe I just get this feeling. And then I go outside and I feel the wind. You know, I like to stand out in the field and actually feel the pressure of the wind and get a sense of, 
How much is it cycling up and down? How quickly? That's mm -hmm. very significant, right? If you go from light winds to very strong winds, thermals are going on. You yeah. know, that's where you get some bad turbulence. When you feel a drop in temperature real quick and then it warms up again, you know, just as the wind shifts in direction and that kind of thing. Those are the days that you are better off. I think, mm -hmm. just, you know, being the experienced skydiver sitting on the ground, watching the inexperienced jumpers get experienced. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. <laughs> You watch them and you laugh and you're sitting on the ground going, oh man, I remember when I was a new jumper, you know, <laughs> and I was suffering from hungry logbook syndrome. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And now, you know, I don't care if I jump or not. I'd love to jump. I, you know, it, Ken Kesey wrote a great book. I think you'd love it. It's very small. It's old from the sixties. It was called handbook to higher consciousness. Oh, and in that book, he said something that was an, an eye opener for me when I was a kid, you know, um, I don't know, maybe 18 or something when I read it for the first time, maybe younger. Um, he said, up your addictions into preferences. Because the addiction to skydiving, the addiction to the sense of accomplishment, the addiction to feeling like I did it, I beat my fears or whatever, that's an addiction too. And it, ca it can cause you to jump when you shouldn't jump, you know? Mm -hmm. And if it's, so there's a need, you know, there's this compelling egoistic need to jump. And if you take yourself out of the ego self, don't let that, you know, sort of take the microphone <laughs> and yell and yell fearful thoughts at you. You know, you just sort of take the step back and go, you know, I, I do love jumping. I love it when it's right. And I love being a jumper on the ground when it's wrong, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because you're still a jumper when you're on the ground. Yeah. This is another reason I was looking forward to this even more so after after that earlier. I was just like, this is going to be the perfect time to yeah. tell and what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we all we all find ourselves in those circumstances where uh, the fear is really welling up. Mm -hmm. And then there's this decision making process. And, and there certainly are, there's lots of times when when you uh, find yourself feeling a lot of, you know, just you feel it in your body. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't feel good. I don't feel good about this jump. OK, great. Good, good, good. Where's that guidance coming from, though? Which voice? You know, you got higher self and you got lower self, and they both speak, but one of them screams, you know, and while well, the lower self screams, and the the upper self whispers and encourages, and is always loving and always accepting of everything you do, everything you choose, because you know it, it just loves you as you are. That's mm -hmm. the real. That's the true self. And so you just got to recognize when that bully voice is speaking up, and it's not your voice. Right. It's, that's the part that, that's really been very helpful for me to reframe what the ego is. Yeah. It's not, it's not me. It's the voices of all those other people I've interacted with. It's the voices of all the, the characters on the TV shows and the movies. You know, I, I'm embodying culture. Mm -hmm. I'm not being an ind individual. You want to be an individual, you listen to the higher self. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, I think, an important recognition. Yeah, yeah. that's all I love that. You know, you know, who am I listening to? You know, which, mm -hmm. voice, which voice within me is, is the one that I've decided is real and, and which one is just programming. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the shame stuff is programming. We think, yeah. we, should, we think we should beat ourselves for chickening out, right? That's <laughs> the word they use, it chickened out. And as a chicken owner, I, I, I take offense to that, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, we, we, you know, if you really look at what a chicken does and thinks and, you know, the way they act, they're all stimulus and response. Mm -hmm. They don't have the ability to evaluate that, whether that loud noise was somebody clapping because their kid rode their bicycle for the first time out in the street, or, you know, it's a predator to come to eat them and tear their head off. You know, it's all the same. They just react in fear automatically, right? Just like that. What was that movie, uh, The Crudes? You ever seen yeah. It? Uh, yeah. Right? So you remember uh, the in Nicolas Cage's character, the dad, mm -hmm. and his wisdom was the old folk wisdom of the ego self, of the, the cellular self that's afraid that it's going to die all the time. That's all it lives in mortal fear of that never not be afraid. <laughs> that was the winning formula, right? Never not be afraid. And so as long as you recognize that that's kind of where the ego lives, yeah. then you can rise above it you, know, you can pull the microphone away from it and and specifically ask your higher self how do you feel about this you know is this okay or not and then you empty your mind and you listen 
You find out what, you know, what uh, your, your true feelings are because our emotional guidance is pretty confusing. You know, on the drop zone, whether you should jump or shouldn't jump is the big one. Uh, it's everything in life too, though. Um, to, to be able to, you know, to feel that emotion and recognize with compassion for yourself that maybe this was just my neurosis talking. Mm -hmm. you know, this, this was the, the voice of the bully in school when I was a little kid that I still hear echoing in my mind saying, you're too scared to go down the slide. <laughs> It's the same, it's the same voice. It hasn't evolved. It hasn't changed. Right. It's this, this sort of one dimensional echo and it's not helping. That's so true. Yeah. yeah. Peel, punch. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I, I think it's important to, uh, to recognize how, how the fear always seems to come along with shame just afterwards. Even a little bit during, you know, in the decision process, there's this this pull towards shame, uh, and it's it's the most useless of the emotions. It is. It's tear. It's pointless. Yeah, it tears us apart from the inside out. It's mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it's not helping. I I do think that guilt, it's it's a terminology. I think guilt can be helpful. So so if you uh, aspire to somebody's moral virtues. By pointing out that, you know, you, you know, the way you like rush through the door and push that old lady out of the way, <laughs> you know, maybe you can aspire to their higher ideals and, and they can look back on it and go, all right, well, maybe, maybe next time I'll stop and hold the door for the old lady. You can say that's a guilt trip. My kids say it to me all the time. <laughs> oh, dad, you're guilting me. No, I'm merely aspiring to your higher virtues, you know, and that compassion doesn't only go out because mm -hmm. I, I can feel you. You're the kind of person that projects outward and you help other people. Selfless. That's exactly what, exactly what just happened. Cause I was I, just being another student, like get out of his head, going straight to the negative. And I'm like, why is it so easy for me to do that for everybody else? It, it, well, it'll be easy for you as well. As long as you shut down the other voice, you know, as, and long enough for the, the other voice, the more positive one that you're using to help other people, you just yeah. point it at yourself. You know, what would exactly. I tell somebody else? Right. right. But you have to objectify a little bit. You got to, mm -hmm. the ego is so subjective. It's so in the experience that's so real. You know, fear is, uh, is immersive. Uh, but to be able to stay in that hot kitchen a little bit longer and just stop in the place of, I don't know yet. You know, I haven't made a decision yet, but I'm going to stay here and clear my mind and relax my body. Mm -hmm. Observe my situation, the specifics of this situation and you jump when it's right when the green light is on you you allow your your inner child to take over and you go and play in the sky yeah you just have to you have to be ready for that and ready for the other one where you watch the canopies are going like this and you go yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't need that yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not in, in it to be afraid I'm, I'm in it to play in the sky without being afraid exactly yes yeah now the other piece that i want to also um mention that's that's been very helpful for me as well especially doing scary stuff because i i do some things that that really you know put me on edge right you know, jumping out of the airplanes over the mountains and that kind of thing um is to recognize that i have done all, i've done my job you know i checked my pilot shoot i checked there's nothing else to do with that i know the winds i know the plan and i get to the end of that and i empty my mind and I relax my body so that my body can speak to my brain through chemistry by not using my body. There's mm -hmm. like I'm running a white flag or, you know, up the flagpole. I'm actually saying to my brain that's generating my thoughts, just, you know, you're at ease. You don't have to be, you know, ready for action. You know, you don't have to be lock and load right now. Everything is okay right in this moment. And you just relax your body for a period of time and you respirate bigger and slower, you know, big breaths all the way in and you hold it for a moment and then you slowly let it out. And it does something. It changes the thoughts that occur to you. We always think that the thought that comes up to us at the, in the moment is the only thought that we could possibly have. And that's not true. Right. I, we could be just a, another train car in the long train of thoughts that I've already been having. And if that's based on neurosis, because that's the engine that's pulling that train, 
you, you know, and you're just making a longer neurosis train. Or if you calm yourself down, you slow the train down, and now you have the opportunity to possibly even change the locomotive to one that's more positive, one that, that, that's eager and trustful of the self. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Right. So the slowing down shows up and then you get to the end of that process and you're sitting in the plane. You're like, I've done all I can do. Engines are noisy and people are starting to get ready. And I know, you know, we're doing something big here. You know, this is major. I'm, I'm literally about to throw my body at the planet and try to miss. <laughs> and and I, I usually recognize that this is about as low as my adrenaline is going to get. I don't want it to get to zero anyway, right? You right. don't want to fall asleep in free fall. You want to be alert and awake and exuberant because that's what allows you to have bigger awareness and bigger uh, capacity for athletic skill. Mm -hmm. That's what saves you is your skills. And so I, I make a decision once I'm down there, okay, this is about as calm as I'm going to get. Whatever's left over in terms of my adrenaline, that, that, that residual, I'm going to flip it around and not call it fear anymore. I'm going to choose to interpret that emotional experience as joy, as excitement. You know, as yeah. excitement. that's what I'm putting in my gas tank. That's what's going to get me to be able to pull hard. It's giving me what I need. That adrenaline is, is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But don't beat yourself up when you can't be like totally Dalai Lama mode in the plane. You just, you know, you go in the general direction, you know, you keep inching your chair closer to the Dalai Lama, <laughs> you know, and, and eventually go, I guess that's about as close as I'm going to get. And I'm going to be okay with this, that this is sufficient. This is, I'm in my optimum performance state. You know, my adrenaline is a 10. I'm not in optimum performance. I'm going to be useless and make terrible mistakes. I'm going to rush. I'm not going to have wide awareness. I'm not going to notice other people. My compassion goes down. My ability to visualize the good skydive is not there anymore because I lose functionality of my prefrontal cortex when I get scared. Mm -hmm. I get angry. Same thing. Interesting. Sort of a sideline there, but yeah. <laughs> the brain physiology. Um, and so I have to choose my emotion mm -hmm. through, the, through the force of my will, even though I've been kind of nervous and I've mostly focused on the task, you know, check the handles. What did I forget? Oh, I forgot my helmet, you know, oh, is my GoPro on? And you get all that stuff done. And then you just enjoy respirating slowly in this state of elevated consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I'm wide awake and I'm excited. And, you know, the clock is ticking to my go time. And in a moment, I get to live my highest life. I get to, to live my dream. Yeah. Um, I just tied about a thousand shoes. I was, I was volunteering at the field day at the elementary school today, oh, manning the, the basketball event or whatever. So much fun, hundreds and hundreds of kids. And I know most of them already. Cause I go in there and, you know, wear my wingsuit and I talk about it. I tied That's so awesome. many shoes at field day. <laughs> so I, you know, I think, you know, you tie your own shoes, you know, you put the rig on, you pay attention to the details and you move slowly. Mm -hmm. You start getting geared up early. And you don't walk around with your rig because you get tired. You sit back down, but you put it on early enough that you can make this whole process like a mass. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just each thing is a ritual. In, in, in your mind, you're almost hearing like classical music. Mm -hmm. And maybe you put in earbuds and you actually listen to classical music. It's amazingly. Yeah. That's a great yeah. one. I use that a lot under canopy when I'm nervous. I'll sing to myself and sort of, you know, soothe the savage beast a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, there's something to that. There's a lot of research that, that suggests that, that music, the right kind of music, obviously, not mm -hmm. death metal or screamo. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not on my, in my playlist anyways. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, exactly, me neither. But something that, that's going to make you feel good, make you feel happy and slow. Slow, yeah. tempo, slow tempo music if you can. And just go through this, this whole ritual of preparing yourself with full awareness and then you can walk to the plane with flat feet, you know, not on your toes rushing because you're late. You're the first one out there in the, and any, any time you have the opportunity, whether it's in the plane or waiting to get on it, I want you here. You know, I, I, had, used, I had a cat a long time ago named Quincy, named after the World Freefall Convention. That's where we stand. And Quincy was lazy. 
and he was a fat lazy cat and he'd sit at manifest at skydav city where i used to live on the manifest counter he'd sit there and everybody on the drop zone with pet quincy and he'd just sit there with his tongue hanging halfway out <laughs> as a cat yeah just lazy mode and yeah that's what i'm trying to convey is mm -hmm. that if you you always revert to lazy mode as your winning formula for your optimum performance kind of readiness, then you're actually ready. You know, nervous and checking your handle 17 times on the way to altitude, that's actually not ready. That's counterproductive. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you try to observe your behavior and mm -hmm. change your behavior if you're fidgeting, if your shoulders are up here, if you got, you know, inside your shoes, you got foot fists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, relax everything be as lazy as you can and then you get under canopy and you check it and make sure it works and you point yourself in a reasonable direction for that altitude that moment and you slow down the parachute and maybe you grab onto the main lift webs i think we talked about or you stick your thumbs in the rings at, on yep. your something like that where you don't have to work hard and you look at the horizon you do it again you, know, you cross your legs so you're comfortable you know maybe get your leg straps forward a little bit <laughs> it's just lean back against it look at the horizon and stop looking around yeah yeah now, those those you know, secrets you know mm -hmm. that was a big reason that i got into canopy course was just like my lack of confidence just under canopy in general and feeling just lost because that's where you lose the direct instruction i mean it's one thing to jump out and have the instructors holding on to you and gradually they you go down to one and then they let go and, and you're earning that along the way and then you're kind of under canopy you might have a radio on but they not to the progression of of actually knowing really what you're doing with the the fabric over your head <laughs> i know it will it's the hardest thing to teach yeah there's the volume of information necessary for safe free falling in comparison to safe canopy flight is not the same right <laughs> not even yeah. close not even close and so that's that's why i do what i do